It's day 12 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Welcome back, friends. Yesterday, we heard the closing arguments from Job, and today we hear from someone in the audience, this new fella, Elihu, who probably feels like the rest of us. He just can't take listening to these fools arguing nothing anymore. So he's going to have his moment, well, five chapters of a moment, to speak his piece. But before we get into it, if you could please help us out, partner with us by hitting that like button if you are here on YouTube, making sure you are subscribed to our podcast. Also, hit that notification bell if you want to make sure that you know exactly when these videos or these podcasts drop so that you can dig into the word. If you are new here, we welcome you. We want to let you know that we have got a website, heartdive.org, where you can sign up for our newsletter so you can receive each day's lesson in your inbox every single day, as well as a free download of our Bible reading plan. This is a chronological reading plan that we are following, and we are reading out of the ESV translation by Crossway. If you have any questions at all, you can look in the show notes or the description box for all the info that you will need for everything about this podcast. So it's Friday. I know people got places to be, so let's go ahead and pray and get into it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are holy, and we treat you as such. We stand in awe of you today. We humble ourselves before you, our great almighty God, the one who was, who is, who is still yet to come. You are the same God. We thank you, Lord, that as we read about the days past, that we can hold on and trust the promises that have already been spoken, for we know that they still remain true today. Your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done, yours. We don't want anything else. We don't want anybody else to dictate our lives, and we don't even want to dictate it ourselves, Lord, because we know that you have our best in mind, and so we surrender ourselves to that today and ask that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Please give us today our daily bread, our nourishment, our spiritual manna, everything that we need to be able to sustain us for this day. And please forgive us for our sins, Lord, anything that we've done to hurt your heart, to hurt anybody else. And I just pray that if we have done something that has gone over the line or that has stopped short, I pray that you will reveal it to us so that we can go make it right. We can reconcile where we have failed and any words that you have spoken to us where we were not obedient, where we didn't listen. Forgive us now, Lord. We confess of all of our wicked ways and we repent from them. We turn from them, Lord. It's an about face. It's walking away and it is walking forward in your will for our lives. Help us also to forgive others when people come against us, when they hurt us, when they say things that are ill-willed or completely out of character. Help us not to hold on to that, Lord, but just to let it go. We just place it at your feet today. We want to be free, Lord. And so I just thank you for giving us that opportunity today. Please do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep the enemy far from us, for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Elihu starts off here in chapter 32, rebuking Job's three friends. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned with anger. So his name means he is my God. Barakel means blessed by God. So a godly man. Some people say that this was a relative of David or a nephew of Abraham. He burned with anger at Job because he justified himself rather than God. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, he burned with anger. So I don't know if you catch the sense that Elihu is pretty darn annoyed. Now, he didn't have the privilege of sitting behind a screen and being able to just type out his angry comments whenever he wanted to like we can nowadays. He actually had to wait his turn. And the entire time, his anger was just welling up within him. And it was righteous anger. I mean, you can can tell by his response. He doesn't start by just spewing accusation, but he speaks slowly, maybe a little too slowly. I mean, five chapters worth of very slow words, but heart check. How do you react when anger starts to well up within you? Are you able to control it? Or do you immediately spout off? And Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you are aged. <laughs> what a very profound statement, right? <laughs> Just kidding. 
Therefore, I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, let days speak and many years teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. It is not the old who are wise, nor the aged who understand what is right. Therefore, I say, listen to me. Let me also declare my opinion. So Elihu is challenging traditional wisdom here by saying that age ain't nothing but a number. He recognizes that there are some old folk that act like toddlers, and then there are some younger who are actually sprouting spiritual gray hairs. He was making the point that true wisdom doesn't actually come with age, but rather by the Spirit of God. That's true. But what about you? Are you able to respect the wisdom that comes from someone younger than you? Or if you're younger, are you able to remain confident around those who are older? Because I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle. I mean, I see how valuable both experiential wisdom and fresh insight is. And we need both of those things to be able to maintain a healthy balance within the church. Verse 11, Behold, I waited for your words. I listened for your wise sayings. While you searched out what to say, I gave you my attention. And behold, there was none among you who refuted Job. So he's saying, you guys didn't prove anything. You didn't present any sort of evidence evidence that held any ground. Or who answered his words? Beware lest you say we have found wisdom. God may vanquish him, not a man. He has not directed his words against me, and I will not answer him with your speeches. So he's kind of taken a little dig at them here, because remember how they all kind of use each other's words against each other? And he's saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to speak my own words. And I don't know if it's because I know how he drones on and on that I'm already feeling annoyed, but... Verse 15, they are dismayed. They answer no more. They have not a word to say. And shall I wait because they do not speak? Because they stand there and answer no more? I also will answer with my share. I also will declare my opinion. For I am full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. Behold, my belly is like wine that has no vent, like new wineskins ready to burst. I must speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. I will not show partiality to any man or use flattery toward any person. In. And I wrote here, uh, except for himself, I feel like he continues to talk just to hear himself talk because he feels like he's impressing himself or something. And the reason why I think this and say this is because he actually gets no mention from God later on. I mean, God rebukes the three friends and says nothing to Elihu. So to me, he's just spouting off a bunch of hot air. For I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. He has basically just spent an entire chapter saying, I've got something to say. So let's get on with it in chapter 33. But now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to all my words. Behold, I open my mouth, the tongue in my mouth speaks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, it just feels a little bit cringy. I mean, it's, it's like me saying, and now I'm going to pick up my pen and write on this paper a word. Is it just me? I don't know if I'm having a bad day, if I feel a little bit more annoyed than normal, but just keeping it real here, people. My words declare the uprightness of my heart and what my lips know they speak sincerely. So he's basically saying, I have no ulterior motives here. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. So he's basically declaring that he is not only anointed, but he's also empowered by the spirit of God. Answer me if you can. Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Behold, I am toward God as you are. I too was pinched off from a piece of clay. Behold, no fear of me need terrify you. My pressure will not be heavy upon you. So he's kind of saying, you know, we're on the same team. And I think when I first read this, I was like, this is a good guy. I mean, compared to the last three, he seems kind of like a saint at this point. And it sounds like he's going to go pretty easy on Job, which is good news. But again, I know the end of the story, so let's continue. Surely you have spoken in my ears, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I am pure without transgression. I am clean, and there is no iniquity in me. First of all, false. And this is where I started getting irritated. Behold, he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. So this is his perception of the words that Job has spoken. And Job never said that he was sinless. He may have said he was blameless that he didn't deserve what he was getting, but he has never claimed to be without sin. 
Behold, in this you are not right. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend against him, saying, He will answer none of man's words? For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings, that he may turn man aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. So I don't know if there's a bunch of implications in here, but it sounds to me like, first of all, he is saying that Job is declaring that he is an equal with God, which at some points it really does seem like Job is actually acting that way in the way that he talks to him. And here in verse 13, Elihu is rebuking Job for complaining that God isn't answering his pleas. Now, what we have to remember is that God always answers us, but his answer is either yes, it's no, or it's not yet. Just because we can't hear the answer doesn't mean he doesn't hear us. So heart check, how do you deal when God's answers seem silent? And then I don't know if he was referring to Job speaking about having nightmares in chapter seven, and then he's saying, you know, maybe God was trying to warn you in those nightmares. And I asked myself over here, how can we determine when God is speaking through dreams and visions? And I wrote this here because I thought I want to do a deeper study on this. And so if anybody has any kind of insight on that, can you write it in the comments? I would love to be able to read that and start to kind of dig into it for myself later on when whenever we're not doing daily studies. But for myself, I just know that anytime God speaks, it should not terrify you to the point where you are paralyzed by your fear because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, right? He gives us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And so I know that He is also the Prince of Peace and He gives us peace. And so knowing that, to me, that says that if He ever speaks in a dream or vision, we shouldn't be scared. We can have a healthy fear that motivates us to change something or to do something that may feel a little bit challenging. But in that, we then begin to rely more on Him. It shouldn't be something that terrifies you the way that He's saying over here. And then in the end of this section, it seems like He's implying that Job has been prideful. Verse 19, man is also rebuked with pain on his bed. So he first said, God speaks through dreams and visions, and now he speaks through pain and with continual strife in his bones so that his life loathes bread or he has no appetite and his appetite, the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen and his bones that were not seen stick out. His soul draws near the pit and his life to those who bring death. Now, while Elihu is implying that Job's pain is perhaps a rebuke from God, we can draw some wisdom from this because there can be found a purpose in our pain. And I am not saying, so please hear me, that God's going to inflict pain on you in order to make a point. But we can shift our perspective when we do deal with pain in our lives. You see, it's easy to sail through life whenever everything is roses and butterflies, but the moment you hit some thorns, you're jolted awake again. So pain can be a good thing because it tells your body that something is wrong. In fact, if you remember back in the day, whenever leprosy was a big thing, it would actually kill the nerve endings in the bodies of those who were affected to the point that when they would sleep at night, the rats would then come eat their noses and their fingers and their toes. And while the doctors at the time thought that leprosy was what was making these people lose their fingers and toes and noses, it was actually because the rats were eating on them because they had no feeling of pain. So perhaps sometimes we do need to feel a little bit of pain so that we do go to the doctor and get well. And sometimes it will be the pain in our lives that brings us back to the great physician. So heart check, are you able to reconcile purpose and pain? And now here in this section, starting in verse 23, it sounds like Elihu is anticipating the coming of Jesus. So keep in mind as you read through this, if there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand to declare to man what is right for him, and he is merciful to him and says, deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then man prays to God and he accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy and he restores to man his righteousness. He sings before men and says, I sinned and perverted what was right and it was not 
repaid to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon light. Now, several sources that I read all said that this does look toward Jesus, whether or not he was actually speaking prophetically for us it's hard not to see Jesus in these verses. The fact that He is our mediator, that He will declare to us what is right for us. He is merciful. He is our deliverer. He does give us a new body and a new lease on life. He does accept us. He brings us joy. He restores us to our righteousness. He redeems our soul from going to hell. And verse 29, behold, God does all these things twice, three times with a man that he may be lighted with the light of life. So he is doing this not to punish Job, but for not only his good, but for our good as well. God knew that Job could handle this. He knew that through this, so many people would be healed. So many people would have a restored hope in who God is as our Redeemer. Pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Be silent and I will speak. If you have words, answer me. Speak, for I desired to justify you. And again, I was like, okay, Elihu's doing some good here. Like he wants to be able to help Job out, and he's given him an opportunity to speak. I mean, I've got so much hope here for him. If not, listen to me, be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. So he ends this chapter by telling Job, if you're not going to say anything, then don't interrupt me because I've got a lot to teach you. And by the way, this is not me rolling my eyes at Elihu, even though I may have once or twice when I have read this story, but... I drew this here because I said, I wonder if Job actually rolled his eyes at some point that made Elihu tell him, hey, you got something to say to me? Yeah, I didn't think so. You need to be quiet. So that could be one other way to look at why he spoke this right here. And then he continues here in chapter 34, then Elihu answered, even though Job didn't solicit his wordy, lofty advice, and he said... Hear my words, you, quote, wise men. I don't know if he was being facetious there. And give ear to me, you who know, for the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. There's one of his profound statements again. Let us choose what is right. Let us know among ourselves what is good. So I don't know if he was kind of teaming up with them at this point saying, you know what, let's go ahead and figure this out together. For Job has said, I am in the right and God has taken away my right. In spite of my right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. Again, he did not say that. What man is like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water, who travels in company with evildoers and walks with wicked men? So he's basically saying he's been hanging out with the wrong people. For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. Well, he didn't actually say that. It sounds like he is answering the question that Job asked in chapter 21, verse 15. Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, true, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. So Elihu is kind of teetering here on bearing false witness because he's got the right information, but the wrong implication. He is implying here that God is punishing Job because of what he has done wrong. So now we're starting to see the truth true Elihu come out as he starts to partner himself with the other three friends in saying that this retribution theology is taking place, where God punishes the wicked and he's good to those who are good, where you will reap what you sow. Now, while that can be true, it is not an absolute. For according to the work of a man, he will repay him, and according to his ways, he will make it befall him. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Again, truth, but overly confident in the way they think that they know it is being applied here. Who gave him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? If he should set his heart to it, and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, and man would return to dust. And now he starts speaking specifically to Job. If you have understanding, hear this, listen to what I say. Shall one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is righteous and mighty, who says to a king, worthless one, and to nobles, wicked man? So he's saying, isn't he fair with all people? Who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor. So he's saying, isn't he fair to all people? For they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die. At midnight, the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away by no human hand." 
for his eyes are on the ways of man and he sees all his steps. So basically nothing is hidden from God. There is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. For God is no need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. So in other words, God doesn't need to listen to your testimony anymore because he knows the truth. He knows what is going on. And this is pretty unfair. I think that Elihu is sitting here saying, you have condemned God just because he's crying out in this agony. Because the thing is, is that Job cried out in agony to God because of the fact that he loves God. If he didn't love God, he would have no reason to cry out to him. Shatters the mighty without investigation and sets others in their place. Thus, knowing their works, he overturns them in the night and they are crushed. So basically, no one gets away with anything. He strikes them for their wickedness in a place for all to see. So he does public punishment because they turned aside from following him and had no regard for any of his ways so that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him. And he heard the cry of the afflicted. When he is quiet, who can condemn? When he hides his face, who can behold him? Whether it be a nation or a man, that a godless man should not reign, that he should not ensnare the people. So who are you to question God's quietness? He can be quiet if he should so please. For has anyone said to God, or this implication is here, for has Job said to God, I have borne punishment, I will not offend anymore. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do it no more. So he's asking him, have you even confessed Job? Will he then make repayment to suit you because you reject it? And this reminded me of when I was little. I remember going to my Filipino uncle's house when I was a little girl and it would be a karaoke fest every single weekend. And my uncle would always sing the song, I did it my way. And I just remember that it rings in my head every time I read anything about doing life our own way. Because that singer was claiming to have no regrets about life because he lived the way he wanted. And Elihu is rebuking Job here by asking, do you really think God should do things your way? And I couldn't help but ask myself, how much of my life am I actually trying to live my own way? So let that serve as a heart check. How much of your life are you expecting God to do your way? See, we can even learn from foolish talk. (laughs) For you must choose and not I, therefore declare what you know. Men of understanding will say to me, and the wise man who hears me will say, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without insight. So he's saying, everyone agrees with me, Job, that you are out of your mind. Would that Job were tried to the end because he answers like wicked men, for he adds rebellion to his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. I just said, wow, so much for not being harsh on him. He is accusing him of being rebellious, of not taking wise counsel from those who are trying to speak into his life and for speaking up against God. And while he has stated a lot of truths here in these chapters, he has also taken the words that Job has spoken and completely overinflated them, taken them out of context, and is applying it to his own agenda. So again, he is edging on bearing false witness. That's what that is. It means you've got some information in your hand, but you're going to twist it all up to make a person look bad. And that grieves the heart of God, especially when a person is innocent in the matter. So with that, let's take a look at some of our deep dive questions. In what ways were you able to see God's heartbeat through this reading? Does it challenge or affirm your understanding of who God is? What can we learn from Elihu's restraint and response in today's keyboard warrior society? Can you tell the difference between righteous and unrighteous anger? When is a reaction warranted and what should it look like? And how can you determine when God is speaking through dreams and visions? So we just thank you, Lord, for being our defender whenever we are kicked to the ground like Job is here. Even in the midst of those who may have good intentions with their rebukes, we know that you have the full story and you're the one who knows the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I pray that our eyes will always be open to that as well. May we also see the value in every single generation knowing that wisdom does indeed come with age, but it doesn't always mean that our age determines that wisdom. And so I pray that we will honor those who have gone before us, paving the way, 
but also welcome the fresh perspectives of those who are coming up after us. And I pray that we will never be the type of people who rebuke simply for the sake of looking or sounding good. Help us to always go about it in a godly way with love and grace. And help us also never to think so highly of ourselves that we begin to twist and misinterpret what others say based on our own agendas, the way that Elihu has done here. Give us discernment, O God, to be able to test the spirit of those who may speak against us. And forgive us where we thought that we knew better than you and demanded our own way. Oh God, I pray that we will always maintain a submissive heart that desires your purpose and your will for our lives. For you are indeed greater than we are and always will be. Help us always to be open to hearing your voice, whether through dreams and visions or even through our pain. But I pray that we will never confuse what it means to have a healthy fear and respect for you but never a heart of terror. And when we go through those seasons of silence, God, please help us to trust that you are indeed speaking in the quiet, even if we cannot hear it. Thank you so much for letting us see a glimpse of you, Jesus, today. You are indeed our merciful mediator, the one who accepts us, who delivers us and restores our righteousness. Thank you for redeeming our soul and working for our good. And I thank you, especially that you are so extremely patient with us. We are eternally grateful for that. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. And I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.